Hi, welcome to the Ethereum Mechanics Foundation Series video number six. This is the final video in the Foundation Series. We're going to discuss new gravity and the very first unified field theory. Up to this point, we've had new electromagnetism, but we've chosen ether as the new reference frame. From new electromagnetism, we have new induction. We showed that new induction is the model of light. It's the model of inertia. It could be wholly or partially part of the electric field that we measure. And in this video, I'm going to show you with the ethereal reference frame, we're going to show you it's also the mechanism of gravity. So let's recap inertia. We have our hypothetical model of matter, which is two inertialist like charges in orbit about each other. Suppose we are going to try to accelerate this system through the ether. Well, this acceleration relative to the ether, as this guy accelerates relative to the ether, according to this model, it's going to incur a force on this guy in this direction. And if this guy is trying to accelerate through the ether, it's going to incur a force on this guy in the opposite direction. And therefore, and we have shown very accurately how we can determine the mass of an electron from this model. And so that is the mechanism of inertia. It's trying to accelerate these charged systems through the ether, causes an inertial reaction using induction that opposes the ability for you to accelerate it. So now if we revisit Einstein's principal equivalence, he said that, well, if you're in a spaceship and you're accelerating by 9.8 meters per second per second squared, which is the acceleration of gravity on the Earth, you will not be able to tell the difference in that spaceship, okay, assuming no windows or anything, even if that spaceship were planted on the Earth. So here he came up with the equivalence between inertia and gravity but not an explanation as to why. Well, his explanation was curved space. Distinti's assertion of identicalness, if we're trying to accelerate this charged system at 9.8 meters per second relative to the ether, and we get a reactionary force due to induction, well, that would be like saying that, well, if I put this, this system on the Earth, the reason why I'm experiencing 9.8 meters per second squared of this system is because the ether is accelerating earthward at 9.8 meters per second squared. So the relative velocity of the system relative to the ether is inertia. And I'm saying it's identical as the form of gravity. Which has a ramification because that means massive bodies consume ether. And if we were to compute the acceleration of ether toward a massive body, well, we just take Newton's gravity equation, divide by m, and that gives us the acceleration of the ether. And if we wanted to compute the velocity of the ether relative to a massive body, well, that's pretty much identical to the escape velocity derivation. So I'm not going to go over that. You can look that up on Wikipedia. And if we put in the calculations for this, it means that ether flows toward the Earth at 11,000 meters per second at the surface. So we're traveling 11,000 meters per second relative to the ether right now, as we're sitting on the Earth being absolutely stationary. And recall from the slide before in the previous video that when our hypothetical model for matter reaches the speed of light with respect to the ether and just surpasses it, um, the matter collapses. So at the speed of light, this matter is on the verge of collapse. So if we were to take this equation, and say, well, okay, how massive does this body have to be for the uh, ether to start approaching at the speed of light, which in theory should collapse the matter? Well, all we're going to do is substitute, set this equal to C and do the calculations. And what we end up with, when we do the calculations, we end up with the Schwarzschild radius. We get the same answer that all the relativistic monkeys came up with, but we're just doing it with a logical assertion of ether in a model, a hypothetical model of matter. And we explain now, from the model of matter, what a black hole is. And this is what a black hole is. And because light propagates at C relative to the ether, and ether is flowing inward at C, then light cannot escape from this manifestation. Therefore, another property of a black hole that we've come to know and love. But there's more, because ether is consumed like it is going down a drain, and fluids that are drained establish an irrotational flow, also known as a vortex, then there must be a rotational component to the ether as well. And in video 23, we calculate that, and that's the calculation, and if the tangential flow of the ether about a mass, this is the tangential flow of the ether about a mass, 
and if you look at the flow, ether flows in, so it spirals in. And so if we were to compute the flow of the ether about the sun at, at the sun's equator, compare that to the velocities of the planets, we find that the planets are moving with the ether. These little dots represent the velocities of the planets at their respective distances from the sun. The red line is the computation of what the irrotational flow of the ether is at those same distances. As you can see, there's great correlation between the velocity of the planets around the ether and the, uh, around the sun and the velocity of the ether around the sun. So essentially, my friends, the planets are stationary with respect to the ether, or very nearly stationary. Mercury and Pluto are a little bit off because their, their orbits are not perfectly circular, they're more elliptical. But according to ethereal mechanics, they're going to lose their velocity relative to the ether and come into nice circular orbits over time. The reason why their orbits are elliptical is they were probably struck and knocked out of their nice, stable, circular orbits. And so there's two critical conclusions here. All objects will eventually come to rest with respect to the ether. Though this process is incredibly slow. Incredibly slow. Probably happens over millions and millions of years. The second is on the next page. Since the velocity of the Earth about the Sun is nearly identical to the velocity of the ether about the Sun, then the relative velocity of the Earth to the ether is essentially zero. So the results of the Michael Memorial experiment should be zero. The inferred phenomenon of length contraction is ill-begotten. It wasn't necessary because we're not moving relative to the ether. In new electromagnetism, I've never had a released model of length contraction because there was never really any derivation that was simple and forthcoming. All the other things were simple and forthcoming. I could never find anything that suggested there was length contraction in the electromagnetic model. Not that there isn't, okay? And I, oh, in the past, I've always considered this, a missing, this missing prediction to represent a flaw in the models. However, with the advent of the Whirlpool model of ethereal mechanics, the hypothetical model is vindicated. And that's where we get into problem with prior knowledge. can lead you down wrong paths. Okay, there are other logical reasons other than uh, Michael Morley why we should consider the phenomenon of length contraction. Okay, but we're not going to look for it. We're just going to keep doing what we're doing, and if the models tell us there's length contraction, then we'll believe it. We don't have, right now, we don't have a prediction or outcome that we really need it for in anything we're doing right now. Okay. And there's visible evidence of the whirlpool. Whirlpool galaxies. The stars are virtually not moving as far as their the ether. They're moving with the ether. So here's the unification. If light, inertia, and gravity are, are caused by the acceleration of charges relative to the ether, then all are the same phenomenon. All are the same phenomenon. Light, inertia, and gravity are all the same phenomenon. And therefore, we've had the world's first gravity wave detector since the beginning of time. It's just we're too stupid to know. And so these imbeciles that released the thing saying, oh, we finally detected Einstein's gravity waves are really out to lunch. They have no clue what they're doing. The simple Mark I eyeball is a gravity wave detector. But we humans are too busy building pyramids to our own arrogance and stupidity to notice the simple truth right before our eyes. So going forward, although this represents a fantastic step forward, we are far from done. New electromagnetism does not explain how fields are manifested in the ether or how the effects propagate from one charge to another or how they were coupled. It's possible there are effects that we are unaware of yet. Uh, rule of Acquisition 17 suggests there is. The new electromagnetism hypothetical model for matter has lots of missing parts to it. Why is it ambiguously stable? How is ether consumed? These aren't explained in the models. So we've got a good first step, but there's lots to go. So in reality, new electromagnetism only explains how one charge affects another. It doesn't explain what goes on in between. So we now need to know how charges affect the ether and vice versa. This is what ethereal mechanics is about. Once we can manipulate the ether, we can cavitate the ether around a starship hull and travel at any speed to the stars. In fact, ludicrous speed is going to be slow gear. 
We will be able to accelerate a massive starship and the crew will have no sensation of motion or ill effects of matter collapse. Because inside the subspace, I'm going to use a Star Trek term there, bubble, the ether is moving only enough to provide Earth-like gravity. So we're basically going to part the ether like a ship parts the water, move the ether around us, but keep ether moving just enough inside the starship to give ourselves the sensation of gravity. And that's how we're going to get off this godforsaken planet. So this is the end of the Ethereal Mechanics Foundation series. Uh, we're going to cover the homework from the previous year in a moment for those who wish to stick around. Ethereal Mechanics going forward. Ethereal Mechanics Wave Theory is already in progress. The next video series to be released is going to be the Ethereal Mechanics Unary Fluid Models, which are just extracted from the Ethereal Mechanics videos, but just put in a finer point, much finer detail and better models. Uh, the rules of acquisition are in progress. They're about 50% done. And for those people uh, that haven't been with me before, I wouldn't recommend going back to the Ethereum Mechanics Legacy Models. Just read video. There's three sets there. You can if you want. But those videos were pumped out real crudely and quickly, and I basically spewed everything. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, the reasons are in the video. Uh, that reason for that doing that has stopped, and so I'm going back and I'm re-releasing things slowly and carefully with better models and better videos and better experiments because now I have the time to do so. I didn't think I had the time before, and so I just spewed. So, and because of that, I spewed things that were really way too early to release. Way too early. Anyway, thank you very much. So the homework from video five, if you take the middle term of new magnetism, and we're going to compute it for uh, this charge first, that's this, and then for this charge, that's this. This it says here, this is R is the radial vector from the source to the target, which goes this way. The velocity of the source is going with that radial ve vector. And therefore, and we're going to consume, say that this is so far away that this is pretty much a straight line. It's parallel line. These are parallel lines for a good approximation. So the velocity is parallel to the radius from here to there. So that's going to be a positive, and because you know that velocity is going to be this way, but because it's negative, that means net force is going to be this way. That's the sign, reason for the negative sign. And so we can substitute Vs with C to get C squared. Put Just put in the distance squared. And if you do the same thing with this guy, now this velocity is opposite to the direction of R. So there's going to be a negative sign and another negative sign, which is going to come out to be negative again. We add all these together, you get 2ke, uh, and then we're going to have a c squared here, but we can substitute km c squared with ke, and then reduce that way. Now, again, we're going to use half charges again, because that's what we did last time. I mean, it's pretty much arbitrary, but let's just stick with half charges, because that's what we've done. Then we're going to get the force as half the Coulomb force, but negative, an attractive like Coulomb force. So again, we have concluded the Coulomb force may be the combination of various other forces. We can't be sure at this time. And we can't even be sure what a unit preton charge is at this time either, because we've been basing the unit preton charge off of the Coulomb force. Okay, again, so we've got to keep rule of acquisition 10 in mind. Thank you very much. This ends the Ethereal Mechanics Foundation series. I thank you for all your support. If you could donate, I'd appreciate it, and uh, get the word out on these videos. Thank you very much.